Hello and welcome back to Abstract Linear Algebra, the video course where we talk about general linear algebra. And indeed, we've already started talking about orthogonal projections and in today's part 15, we continue with that. In particular, today we will talk about the idea of an orthogonal projection onto a finite dimensional subspace. However, as always, before we go into the details, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And please don't forget to visit my webpage with the link in the description to download additional materials for the videos. Okay, I would say let's first start by recalling the one dimensional case and by looking at an example for that. And in order to keep it simple, let's say we have R2 together with the standard inner product. Moreover, let's consider a vector x in R2 that we want to project onto a line. And the line is always given by a non-zero vector r. And now let's put some numbers to it. Let's say r is given by 1, 1 and x given by 5, 4. Okay, now it's important to know that the vector r here describes the whole line. Hence, instead of r, we could also consider a vector r hat that is normalized with respect to our inner product. Which simply means, if we calculate the length of this vector with the inner product, we get out 1. Therefore, this whole transition here is easy. You just calculate the length of r and then you divide by it. And in conclusion, you could call r hat a unit vector. Now I'm telling you that because the formula for calculating the orthogonal projection looks much simpler with unit vectors involved. And for this please recall, orthogonal projection means that we split the vector x into two components. And the one component that lies completely on the line here is what we call the orthogonal projection of x onto the line. And in order to keep the notation simple, we call this component p and the other one n. And at this point you should recall the formula for p that we have shown in the last video. There we have to calculate the inner product of r with x and then we have to divide by the inner product r with r. And then we multiply this scalar with the vector r to get a vector out. So this is the formula and now you should realize that we have in the denominator here the length of r squared. Hence we can reformulate the whole formula with the unit vector r hat. And what we get is really simple. We get r hat in the inner product with x times r hat. Okay, so you see r hat does the same job as r, but because it has length 1, this formula looks much nicer because we don't need to divide by the length squared anymore. And then what we get is a very nice formula which is easy to remember. Indeed, some people use that to remember the orthogonal projection completely by saying we just need a unit vector r hat together with the inner product where r hat is in the left component. Okay, so this is the general thing, but now let's calculate it for our example. So not hard at all, we calculate the standard inner product and then we see we just have 5 plus 4 here. And of course also times our vector r hat. Hence what we get is simply 9 halves in both components. Okay, and then in the next step we can also calculate n, which is simply x minus p. So in the first component we subtract 9 halves from 10 halves, so we get out 1 half. And in a similar calculation in the second component we get out minus 1 half. So you see, calculating orthogonal projections is really not so complicated. Therefore the natural question is, can we generalize the whole thing to a higher dimensional subspace? So what is the best idea to get such a generalization? So maybe let's first sketch such a subspace in two dimensions. So instead of a line, now we have a subspace u here and maybe let's say it's a plane in R3. Therefore, a general vector x in the vector space could look like this. And now you can see, we want to have the same thing. We want to have one component p inside the subspace and one component n 
that is orthogonal to u. So the idea is exactly the same, but the calculation might be much harder because we have a lot of freedom in the general subspace. However, if it's a finite dimensional subspace, we know that we can describe the whole subspace with finitely many independent directions. In short, this means we can use a basis of u and maybe reuse what we already know from the one-dimensional case. So for the two-dimensional subspace here, this means maybe we can just use two one-dimensional orthogonal projections to get the correct one here. In fact, also in this general setting, the orthogonal projection is uniquely given. Hence, if we write x as p plus n, where p comes from the subspace u and n from the orthogonal complement of u, then we know there is no other decomposition for x in this way. Indeed, the proof we wrote down in the last video works exactly the same in this general case. And what it also shows is an important relation between the subspace u and its orthogonal complement. So it's definitely something you should remember. The intersection of u and u perp is almost empty. The only thing they have in common is the zero vector. And this is not a surprise because both things here are subspaces. So you should remember this relation holds for every subspace u in v. And here you might already know that this equation follows immediately from the properties of the inner product, namely from the property that the inner product is positive definite. Therefore I think it's not really needed to formulate the explicit proof here. What we should do now is to formulate what we can say in this general case. For this we take again a general f vector space together with an inner product. And now let's take a subspace u in v with the fixed dimension k. This means that we can just take a basis with k elements. So let's call this basis b and the elements inside b1, b2 and so on. So this is a standard thing we can do for every subspace u. And now it turns out if we want to have a vector in the complement of u, we don't have to check the orthogonality with every element in u. It's sufficient to check it for the basis elements. So maybe let's say we have a vector y in v and then we can say the following. y is orthogonal perpendicular to each element in u if and only if y is orthogonal to each element b1, b2 and so on. In other words, we only have to check this orthogonality for finitely many vectors. So you can remember, checking the basis is enough for the orthogonality. And please don't forget, this fact holds no matter which inner product we choose. So it holds for any inner product. And therefore, we should be able to write down a general proof of this fact. And there the first thing to note is that we don't have to show this direction at all. This is immediately given because the basis elements definitely lie in u. So we only have to check that the basis elements are already sufficient. Indeed, this is also not so hard because we can use linear combination and the fact that the inner product is linear in the second argument. So let's first start with the assumption here. We know that y gives us zero in the inner product with bj. So you know this is exactly the definition of this perpendicular sign. But now we don't have any problem at all. We can just multiply with scalars on both sides. Let's call the scalars lambda j and then you see no matter what we do, which scalars we choose, we will never change the zero on the right hand side. And we also will not change it if we sum up all these terms. So now we just have the sum from 1 to k. And now at this point the linearity in the second argument for the inner product can come in. This means we just pull in the scalars and the sum. And there we get that every linear combination with the basis vectors combined with y in the inner product gives us zero. And since we have a basis here, we know that every u in u has such a linear combination representation. 
Therefore, we have exactly shown what we wanted. Okay, so you see, now we can conclude, if we want to find an element in the orthogonal complement, we just have to check the orthogonality for the basis. And indeed, this one helps a lot if we want to calculate the orthogonal projection onto a subspace. Now we can be very general with our subspace and the vector space and the inner product, but the picture from above still holds. We can always visualize the situation like that, because actually we just want the two components here. But the whole framework here can be very abstract, because we only need an f vector space together with an inner product. And the only restriction we will do now is to consider a finite dimensional subspace. Indeed, this makes the generalization from the one dimensional case very simple. Actually, everything looks very similar. We still take a general vector x in v, and then we search for such a decomposition where p lies in u and n is orthogonal to the subspace. And to make that clear, I now write that n is in the orthogonal complement of u. Okay, and then the names we have for these two components are still the same from the one dimensional case. p is the orthogonal projection of x onto u, and n is the normal component of x with respect to our subspace u. We have already mentioned that the proof for the uniqueness of such a composition is the same as last time, but the calculation, the proof for the existence, is a little bit different. You might already see how we do it. We just take a basis of u and then we calculate more or less similarly to before. And indeed, that's exactly what we will do, but I want to do it in the next video. So I really hope we meet there again and have a nice day. Bye bye.